guys. So, welcome to Grad Seminar on Friday. Uh, my name is Kenneth Finnegan, and I'm going to be talking to you today about vacuum tubes. Uh, a few pieces of logistics first. Erickson's not here today since he is in, down in San Diego dealing with alumni to try and give you guys more money. Um, so it's nice. Um, other logistics things, I am going to be recording this, um, and it will be going up on YouTube. So if you have any serious problems with your questions being recorded, you can come up to me afterwards or anything. Um, and lastly, since this is grad seminar, I think I'm supposed to make some cliche comment about how you're the next generation of engineers and you guys have to solve the hard problems and stuff. So now that we got that out of the way, we can actually give an interesting talk here. All right, so I'm going to be talking about the physics of vacuum tubes. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about how they work, why there's so many components to them, and why they're still relevant today, but no one ever talks about them. A little bit about myself first, my name is Finnegan. I got my BS in Mechanical Engineering at UC Davis back, I graduated in 2012. Uh, so uh, that was relatively recently, and then I took six months off working for a computer programming company. I was a computer programmer for a computer vision company, and then I started my MS and EE here. And I'm actually one of you, I'm not supposed to graduate until June at this point. Um, and vacuum tubes have nothing to do with my thesis, despite what several of you think. I am an avid electronics hobbyist. so. For as much electronics as you guys do in your lab as I do about 10 to 15 times as much of that in my free time. Um, I'm an officer of the Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club, which is valuable in that most of the vacuum tubes that you see in mere mortals' hands these days tend to be in amateur radio. Because there aren't very many other people that tend to want to have amplifiers up in the one kilowatt range. Um, for, am for amateur radio, we're allowed uh, one and a half kilowatts of radio power on several separate bands, where all of you schmucks are only allowed like one watt on ISM. So um, that's why you tend to see a lot of uh, vacuum tubes in amateur radio. Here is my blog, so if you're interested in just my life, it literally is blog.thelifeofkenneth.com. It's got about 500, almost 500 blog posts on it about just various projects I've done throughout the year. Um, my life, and there's my Twitter account if you guys want to follow my ramblings on a day-to-day -day basis. So vacuum tubes. Who here has seen a vacuum tube before 20 minutes ago? All right. How many of you know what a vacuum tube kind of generally is, like the, the concept of it? How many of you know what an electron is? Okay, good. Um, how many of you have never touched a vacuum tube before? Oh, wow, that's... All right, cool. So we'll pass two of them around. So this is just a, see what is this? Oh, we won't pass them around. Here, we're going to pass this around. So I'm just going to pass one vacuum tube around. Um, afterwards, you can get all up close and personal with them. But let's talk about why I'm talking about vacuum tubes at all right now. Because um, talking about vacuum tubes in 2014 seems pretty bizarre to most people. Um, first of all, they're a novel bit of history, right? I mean. Vacuum tubes have been around for just slightly over 100 years at this point. Um, I am kind of a amateur historian for engineering, so I enjoy collecting the old engineering texts, and I find them rather entertaining. And so I just like studying old engineering, because there's a lot of parallels that you see the whole industry cycle through every 30 years or so. Um, they've been around longer than transistors. Um, this is useful because it means that They've been around about 60 years more than transistors have, which means there's about 60 years more of decent textbooks on them, right? And so uh, my personal favorite is The Electronic and Radio Engineering by Terman. Uh, this is a book that was printed back in the 30s until 50s era. Um, and not only is it a good book on vacuum tubes, but it has good other electronic stuff, right? I mean, electronics hasn't fundamentally changed in the last 100 years. We just swapped out components for cheaper and better ones. Uh, the Radio Handbook is also an, another good one um, that if you're interested in this hobby, you would want to get. Um, it's, a, it's a good way to visualize electron physics, right? Because in contemporary electronics, you never deal with free floating electrons. You're only dealing with charge carriers in substrates, um, where electrons operate on the principle of a free electron moving through space. Um, so it, you can get lots of interesting demos there. They are unbelievably high power, right? This vacuum tube right here that I'm going to talk about towards the end is rated to dissipate one kilowatt. It's, you can, with a class C high efficiency amplifier, you can get about 3,200 watts out of that. Um, 
Just recently, I started seeing some semiconductor products that can go up to about the 500 watt range for a single semiconductor device. But for most, amp most solid state amplifiers that you see above about the range of 100 to 200 watts, typically it's several transistors that are then ganged together, which tends to be a more difficult amp amplifier design. Um, and finally, they're still in use, right? If you think about it, television stations, and radio stations and radar systems, when you're dealing with 500 kilowatt transmitters or something like that, vacuum tubes still make the most sense, right? And so they tend to be much more robust and they're much higher power. Um, and they're just still used today. Any questions on that intro? Perfect. All right, so let's first review electrons since you guys have probably haven't taken your electron physics course in. I don't know, two years at this point. So electrons are what's typically used to determine a material's conductivity, right? And so metals tend to be conductive because they have very loose valence electrons in their metallic bonds, where plastics, since they have very strong covalent bonds, tend to not be conductive at all. Um, electrons are negatively charged, thanks a lot, Benjamin Franklin. Right? Um, is he had a 50 50 chunk? Is what Benjamin Franklin's kite experiment, what was really most interesting about that experiment was that he was taking the, the Greek philosophy that there was two different kinds of electric fluid. It was vitreous and um, whatever the amber one was. And he proved that the two of them were just different pressures of the same electric fluid, which we now call electrostatic force. Right? And so he had a 50-50 chance about guessing which one the charge carrier was, and he guessed wrong. So we now get to deal with current flowing in one direction, and the electrons actually moving in the other direction. So that will inevitably get confusing during this talk. Um, and the electrons, since they're negatively charged, are attracted to positively charged um, conductors and positively charged ions, and are repelled from other negatively charged uh, electrons and ions and conductors. So vacuum tubes operate on this concept of free-floating electrons. Um, electrons normally just live in conductors and everything else, and it takes a little bit of deliverance to take an electron and get it out free-floating in space. There's a couple different ways to do this. The first way to do it is just by applying such a large electrostatic force that you physically rip it off of whatever it is, whatever it's on, right? This is used in cold discharge, uh, cold cathode devices. So like this right here is a really tiny, this is a uh, neon glow tube. And so if you stick this into an outlet, um, I'm applying about 100 volts DC across this. And you can see one of the cathodes is glowing because electrons are getting ripped off of it. And the other one is not because that's a positive um, uh, element. Um, in air, I think it's something on the order of about 30 kilovolts per centimeter to rip electrons off of something else. And so to do it at any sort of reasonable voltage, like 100 volts, you need to lower the pressure. Is the conductivity through a gas increases down to some minimum uh, pressure, and then as you approach a hard vacuum, the conductivity, the resistance goes up again. And so we're talking, uh, I believe it's on like the one percent to thousandths of a percent of atmospheres inside of the tube there. So relatively low pressure is but nothing approaching hard vacuum. And at that point you have enough gaseous molecules around to act as a plasma, but not so much to make it difficult to move electrons through it. Um, thermal ejections is when you heat something up, electrons come off of it. Um, so, for example, a light bulb, tung a tungsten filament light bulb, ejects electrons, but you don't notice because they just fall back onto it because when the electrons leave, the filament becomes positive and they come back. Um, most vacuum tubes operate by thermal ejections. And then mechanical is the fact that if you take one electron and you hit a conductor with it hard enough, it'll bounce off one or several electrons off of that surface. <coughs> this is used in some sort of amplifier tubes uh, namely uh, photomultiplier tubes, where it has a whole series of baffles, and you strike the first one with an electron, and that knocks off five electrons, and that hits the next plate, and you get 25, and you get 125, and then 625, right, and it just multiplies. Um, so that's used in some amplifiers, but I'm not going to talk about it today, because I only have an hour, and that would be at about 
the three and a half hour mark in this talk. A um, little bit of history. Uh, 1870s, they figured out both therm uh, thermionic uh, operations for vacuum tubes and the crystal semiconduction that you guys use in all of your semiconductors today. Um, in the 1904-1905 range, they developed the very crude vacuum tube diodes and um, vacuum tube tri triodes, which are equivalent to the transistor. Um, it wasn't until the 1950s, and, they, and the, the concept of a crystal diode existed during this period, but it tended to be very fin finicky and very low power. It was, um, it was a classic World War I uh, operation that you would take your razor blade when you're in the trenches and you would throw it in the mud and let it rust, and then you would take a, your pencil and you would find a good spot on your rusty razor to build a crystal radiant. Right? And this is because several different oxides, like lead sulfate oxides, um, intrinsically just make <coughs> diode junctions. Right? So for a, a simple crystal radio, you can do this with any piece of metal. Uh, the problem is if it's, you put more than a few microwatts or milliwatts through it, you destroy it, and you have to then sit there and hunt around for a new good spot on your razor. Um, you guys don't probably wouldn't like it if you had to open up your cell phone and hunt around for the good spot on your processor. So, um, so they weren't really serious. Any, any semiconductors weren't really serious until about the 1950s. And in the interim here, in the 19 aughts until the 1940s, um, namely up until World War, World War II, there was a lot of development in the vacuum tube um, region, and a lot of really good books came out of it, and all sorts of smart stuff that then became eventually semiconductors. At which point they, at this point they said, yeah, no, vacuum tubes are totally irrelevant, but, you know, can't argue with that. So let's talk about just the vacuum diode. Anyone got any questions before we get jump into this? Nothing. Okay. So the vacuum diode operates just like a silicon diode in that it allows current to flow in one direction, which in this diagram is down, and doesn't allow current to flow in the other direction, which in this diagram is up. Unfortunately, since electrons and current are opposite, the arrows in here are electrons, not current. Um, and so, what you do is you can is you either have a heated cathode or an indirectly heated cathode. So in this case, I'm showing it with a separate heater and then a cathode here. The cathode is specially treated with typically a strontium oxide or a tungsten thorium carbonate, uh, car uh, carbonate uh, coating so that it has a higher tendency to emit electrons. That being said, you still need to heat it up to about 1700 Kelvin, um, at which point it will start emitting electrons. Um, the electrons then are pulled towards the plate, fall onto the plate, and move out the top of this, allowing current to flow in the opposite direction. Right? Where if you apply a voltage in the opposite direction, so if you try and pass current this way, you would draw electrons towards the surface here, but this surface isn't hot, and it's not specially coated, and so they sit there. And so while electrons have, have, are perfectly free to move this direction, they don't have a tendency to move this direction. And that is a diode. Um, for example, this came out of the Terman book. So in 1950, they were studying the exact same diode rectifier circuits that you guys study now. Right? Half wave, full wave, full wave bridge. Right? Replace those diode icons with a sil silicon diode, and you have the exact same literature you guys have now. It's amazing. Right? Here's an example of a um, what's called a mini tube rectifier. So this is the 6X4. The 6 indicates that it is a 6 volt heater. So there's a little heater in it that draws about 300 milliamps at 6 volts. So if you figure that out, it's about two watts just to heat this up before you even do anything useful. And that's per tube, right? So two watts just to heat this up. And then the four means that there's four elements. A cathode that's heated, a heater to heat the cathode, and then this has two plates on it, and so that this would be what you would use for the full wave center tapped rectifier. So this is two diodes in one package because then you only need one heater, right? And I've got an example of it here. I, I always kind of claim that it looks like a Batman dart because it's the, the heater and the cathode is right in the middle and then one of the plates comes out and goes up this way and the other plate comes out and goes down that way. Um, but we'll pass this around starting over here. 
So that is the 6x4 vacuum diode. Um, it is a power rectifier on the order of about 300 milliamps. You can push a whole 300 milliamps through that vacuum tube, which is a big deal for a vacuum rectifier since this, the 6AL5, is A, quite a bit smaller, still a 6 volt heater, so it still consumes about the same amount of power, and this is two completely separate diodes. And you can see a little bit easier. Here's the heater element lead coming in, there's the cathode, and this is the plate right here. 10 milliamps. All right, so let's talk about the actual junction voltages here. So I'm going to shout out, what is the junction voltage for a silicon diode? 0. 0.6. 0. 0.6. You were close. <laughs> close. Um, so this is this is the semiconductor IV equation um, for a forward biased diode as a function of the reverse bias leakage um, e to the power of the voltage across the diode, time uh, or divided by the ideal the ideality uh, factor, which is a function of the actual physical configuration of the junction. Um, the thermal voltage of the silicon, and then the result is the, the current through the diode. Right? So this is what the silicon junction looks like. Conveniently, since it's E raised to the power of the voltage, <coughs> around, around the range of 0 0.6, 0 0.7, it goes up exponentially, and we like to just call that up. Right? So that's, that's what the silicon diode looks like. And I'm about to explain to you the vacuum tube IV equation. And this right here is why audiophiles think vacuum tubes sound better. Right here. The current through a vacuum diode or any vacuum heated cathode two plate interface is a function of the pers permissivity of that vacuum tube, which is a function again of the physical configuration of the cathode to the plate. So if they're really close, they have high permissivity. If they're really far away or if they're you know, askew, they have lower permissivity. And the diode voltage raised to the 3 half power. Voltage to an exponent that's not even squared versus E to the power of V. Right? So if you think back to your Calc 2 classes, you'll realize that those are very much divergent functions, which means that there is no notch in a diode ID curve like there is for silicon, right? So a silicon diode would be 0, 0, 0, and right about here would conduct up about five stories. Um, this is the 6x4, which I just already showed you, but you'll notice that to actually pull 200 milliamps through it, you're going to have about a 40 volt drop across the diode. This is unfortunate. This is why Audiophiles think vacuum tubes sound better, though, because this curve here is a whole hell of a lot less sharp than the one for diodes. Um, if you were to build a fully linear vacuum tube amplifier and a fully linear transistor amplifier, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. The, the, where you're able to tell the difference between a vacuum tube amplifier and a transistor amplifier is when you run it into distortion and it, instead of clipping hard, tends to clip softer like this. Because instead of you having a 0.7 volt headroom from your bias junction to clipping, you have 40 volts and you're still not even really clipping out here. So that's why it sounds softer, is because you're essentially doing a low pass filter and taking off any sharp edges that you would get from distortion. Any questions on that? Cool. We got there. All right, so let's talk about the vacuum triad. Um, so, given your cathode plate interface, you can move electrons between them. And then, if you want to modulate that stream with an electrostatic force, you could use that to amplify what was a small electrostatic force on the control grid into a large current as, as electrons flowing from the cathode to the plate. Right? And so, as electrons are coming off of the cathode here, they approach the plate, the grid, and if the grid is very negatively biased, it repels the electrons and they just hang out here and go back on the cathode. Where if the, cap the grid is positively biased, the electrons get drawn towards it, miss, and then fall towards the plate. 
So that is the vacuum triad. Electrons are approaching this imperfect screen that sits there and either attracts them more or repels them. They inevitably, some of them will fall onto the grid, but most of them miss and end up on the plate as useful information, right? And so with a relatively high impedance on the order of 500 k ohm inputs, you can get about one to five k ohm outputs from an amplifier like this. Voltages uh, that we were talking about here, six volts on the heater, typically six or 12 volts there. The control grid is typically biased at about negative 10. So really, realistically, it always repels the electrons. But we have typically about 250 volts here for a small signal uh, vacuum tube like you've seen so far. Um, for higher power tubes, you get up to the range of 2,000 volts up to 10,000 volts. Yes? Is this a filter? Uh, this right here is just an amplifier. So why would you need the control grid? Uh, the control grid is the equivalent of the gate in the field effect transistor. And so when you have, is if without the control grid there, electrons would just flow continuously. And then by putting the control grid in there and then applying some changing signal to it, you're changing how many electrons want to flow or not. And so, um, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. What kind, of, uh, what kind of voltages would you have to generate on the control grid? Uh, the control grid, um, I think I have a plot for it a little bit later, but you would bias it at something on the order of negative 10 to negative 40, and then it, it, the changes in it could be as little as the 20 millivolts you get out of a microphone, right? That being said, for each stage of vacuum tube, you're only going to see something on the order of about a 10 to 30 times voltage gain. So to get a microphone up to PA level, you do need more, generally more stages than you do in a typical vacuum tube. Another question over here? Yeah. So is there any relationship between the, like the MOSFET triode region of operation and the vacuum triode? Uh, the junction FET, all right, the MOSFET um, the MOSFET is close, but if you look at a junction FET, which has kind of gone out of style recently, the operation is exactly the same. Is you can literally take any vacuum tube triode amplifier, and instead of putting 250 volts here, put 12 volts here, and adjust the biases accordingly, and you can use it with JFETs. MOSFETs are a little bit hairier because there's no way for any electrons to fall onto the equivalent of the grid on MOSFET because it's completely isolated. But with junction FET, since it's a PN junction here, when you drive the equivalent of the grid positive, it allows conduction from electrons. I think that covered the other question there was over there. So here's a typical circuit um, that looks exactly like a standard JFET buffer. So a signal comes in with a biasing resistor to ground, right? which you would think would pull it to ground, but due to the fact that some electrons are happen happening to fall onto the grid from the cathode, pulls the input negative. And so this is a self-biasing amplifier, which is kind of nice. <coughs> this right here is your standard resistor and capacitor on the equivalent of the emitter and an NPN transistor. That's your negative feedback um, on the bottom there for a common emitter amplifier. And then here, for some reason in vacuum tubes, schematically like all the power supplies come from the bottom. And so here's your 250 volts going through a resistor on the order of, I believe, like 20K. Um, and then, so this, this point right here for a, like a standard class A amplifier, you would bias it at about half of your supply voltage. So you'd be dissipating about 100 volts into your resistor right here, and then the output would be sitting there going up and down, right? And so this is straight out of the radio handbook. They give you this schematic, and they list a whole bunch of different tubes, and they say, list what plate voltage you want, how much gate, how much impedance you want, and they just sit there and list all these numbers. So designing amplifiers for vacuum tubes is actually in some ways a lot easier than it is for transistors because they don't expect you to do any of the math for it because there isn't as much math to do. All right? Um, so 
You'll notice, if you look at these uh, namings here, you'll notice that they're all over the place. There's, there's like a 6C4, 12AU7. Um, how vacuum tubes are named when they're small receiving ones like this, the first number is the filament voltage. So 6 volt heaters versus 12 volt heaters. That was a thing because your car, back then cars were either 6 volts or 12 volts, which was useful. Um, the letters, as far as I can tell, mean almost nothing. And then the numbers afterwards are the number of different elements in them. Right? So when you see a 7F8, it means there's eight different elements going into that glass envelope, be it a cathode, a plate, plus many grids, or several sets of cathodes, plates, and grids. Uh, so this is a close-up of the 6J5 triode, which is one of the classics. It's a relatively large tube here. It can dissipate all of an entire two and a half watts, uh, which, you know, compared to what, 800 milliwatts for a 2N2222 is a lot, but a 2N2222 is this big and doesn't require three watts of heat. So, I mean, there's disadvantages here. Um, but if you look at this, all you see up here is the plate, right? So, um, the actual, tri uh, actual triode junction is going on right here. You can see, again, the heater coming out the base here, um, and you can see nothing of the grid since it is shrouded in that. The reason that you see these big fins out here is because it's inside a vacuum, right? You can't have any gas in here, because if you had any gas in here, you would produce positive ions. And since the, the, transit, since the vacuum tube is operating on the movement of electrons, if you have positive ions flying around in the opposite direction, it starts to mess stuff up. Uh, namely, for one thing, if you go back and look at this special coating we have here on the cathode, which is usually like a strontium oxide, and you hit that strontium oxide with a 20 volt positive ion, you will actually chip some of it off. And so uh, the, the way that you destroy a vacuum tube um, accidentally is that you overload any trace, uh, pause, any trace gas that is, happens to be in there, you overload the plate cathode junction, create plasma, and then slam it into the cathode, breaking off this coating. Um, for direct heating, for direct heating where you actually use the heater itself as a cathode, they tend to be more robust since tungsten is tungsten um, and not some lame ass little strontium oxide coating on, you know, just pickle. Um, so they tend to be, so the higher power tubes tend to not use this indirect heating method, but instead tends to use more robust methods. Um, this, so this is a cutaway of it again, so you can see heater in the center, the grid is a spiral, um, and then the plates on the outside. Uh, this is the 6J6, which is a dual triode. Um, it's kind of interesting because it shares one cathode, which makes this very useful for mixers. Is if you put a biasing resistor on the bottom of it, this is equivalent, this one device is kind of the equivalent to that. And so when you put um, your LO, your local oscillator in on one, and um, your inter intermediate frequency on the other, what comes out of the bottom and the top is a mixture of the two of them. So this is used a lot in mixers, um, as well as just basic uh, non-negative feedback, since if you tie both of these to ground, it doesn't make any difference. Um, so that's the 6J6. This is a 6J6 with nitrogen gas poison. Um, so this is in my vacuum tube tester, which I have in the grad lab if anyone's interested in playing with a vacuum tube tester after the talk. Um, this bright orange light right here is what little of the heater you can see. So the orange light is totally normal, and that big purple glow that you see everywhere is very much not normal. <laughs> is that, that is the, the, by the fact that at some point some nitrogen, or probably air, which is mostly nitrogen, has leaked into this vacuum tube probably due to the fact that it was kicking around in someone's old you know, wooden crate for four decades before I bought it um, for 25 cents. So, um, so I stuck on there and fired it up. It actually tests good, but I wouldn't actually want to try and run any power through that, right? Because that's, that's not so good. Um, but it is very pretty, though, so I mean, if you're looking for something very steampunk or something. Um, this, this is an example of how tiny these vacuum tubes go. Um, 
Of course, while they had this great standardized naming convention of the 6J6, they came up with a second standardization at the same time, which was just a random four numeric number that meant nothing. Um, but yeah, that's my thumb on the left there. Um, this isn't the smallest vacuum tube that existed. There were several that were much smaller than it, but I haven't been able to get my hands on any of them. If anyone has any that they don't want, um, but vacuum tubes were at one point used in hearing aids. Right? You can, you, they specially designed the plates so that they didn't have to run on 250 volts, since that would have been a little awkward. Um, but there are 12 volt vacuum tubes that run both the heater and the plates on 12 volts with terrible efficiencies, and they're totally underdriven, but they work. And so um, early hearing aids before the you know, advent of the transistor actually used vacuum tubes. This is a higher power. Um, so now we're getting up to the higher power range. So far we've been in the <clears throat> uh, one to five watt usable range. This is the first power tube I'm showing you. This is an 811A, which is one of the classics, um, at 45 watts of dissipation, and it can give out 250 watts output. You had a question? You had a question? Yeah. Um, what temperature did you say you usually want to run the cathode at? Um, for oxide coating uh, cathodes, you want to run them, uh, they typically start emitting at about 1700. For, uh, if you have an untreated tungsten filament, you're looking at something more like 2500 Kelvin. So for the hearing aids, do they have to shield that? Right? Yeah, they would have to have some insulation on that. Because, I mean, the, the whole envelope gets bloody hot, right? Because, because all of the cooling off the plate is all radiant. And so you very much need insulation and may or may not burn yourself when you try and pull a freshly tested tube out of a tester without thinking about that. And then how variable is the conductivity and whatnot of the diode based on the temperature? Or, well, any of these. Um, I believe it's exponential growth. And so as long as you are above the emissivity threshold for that surface treatment, um, you'll see it pretty much always saturate. Uh, is what tends to be the limiting factor for how much current you can pull through a cathode is the space charge around the cathode. As we go back and look at our grid diagram here, so electrons are flying off of this cathode. When they're flying off, there are then negative charges between the cathode and the plate. And so when you have electrons here, these electrons are like, nah, I'm good. I'm just going to stay here. Right? And so if you try and pull the plate voltage higher and higher and higher, eventually, I mean, you can pull more current through it based on this equation, but the squared comes from the velocity across it and the one half, the minus one half exponent, because this is really two minus one half at the top here. Squared comes from the fact that it's the velocity across this gap, and the one, negative one half comes from the fact that it's the space charge around the cathode slows down more electrons moving through it. What, what frequency limitations do you see on some of these? Um, it depends. Um, 6J6 right here, this one's usable up to about 600 megahertz. Right, so you compare that to like a 2N22 and it's actually a little bit better. Right, and so it was a very long time, right? And they developed transistors in the 50s, but it wasn't until the 80s that anywhere that demanded high frequency or high, um, high power performance that they were even a discussion. And when you start talking about stuff up in the tens of gigahertz at anything more than about half a watt, vacuum tubes are still the best. All right. So, um, 811 triode. So, at this point, we're looking at something this big right here. Um, so, this is the 811. Um, you'll notice by kind of the fact that it's got some scarring on it, it actually has been used. Because I actually traded this with Mike. He's in here, right? Yeah, yes. Um, I traded this to Mike for a watch because I very much wanted it because this is what a plate looks like normally, right? So you've got your, you've got your grid right here. There's a direct uh, thorinated uh, tungsten filament in the middle of it. It's the cathode. You have your plate, your radiant cooling fins here. And then this is what they look like when you overload them. So whatever amplifier this was in went into a fault condition and it very promptly melted the entire plate here. Right, so that shiny bit there is not very much supposed to be flat, it's very much indented, right? So at some point, we grossly, he grossly overloaded this, whoever it was, and melted it. It still works, right? If you overload a transistor like this, you're done, you're history, right? 
transistors gone, and probably a bunch of stuff around it, right? With vacuum tubes um, in the real early days, with you know, with any amateur, you know, like high schooler who could barely afford to buy one vacuum tube, if you wanted more power, you would run it as hot as you could, and you would inevitably melt holes in your plate, and you would just deal with that, right? And so, I mean, vacuum tubes have always gotten a really bad rap because, you know, oh, in computers, the computers only have five hours uptime until one of the other 10,000 vacuum tubes fail. But as long as you don't, as long as you have a vacuum tube in a good condition and it's in stable condition and you're not fighting statistics on 10,000 of them, they are unbelievably good. Right? They sit there, they'll just crank forever. Ooh. Anyway, I just killed my watch. Um, but, like you brought up, um, they do have a upper frequency limit. Um, for typical vacuum tubes in the small signal range, we're looking at about 600, uh, 600 megahertz. For the larger power ones like this, uh, it depends, but you're usually limited to just HF. You might be able to get VHF through some of the smaller ones, um, but you're typically limited to about the 50 to 100 megahertz range. Which means that, you, to, and the main thing that's limiting that is the transit time as you move across um, the gap between the cathode and the plate. So if you want higher frequencies, you need to move the plate and the cathode closer together. There's also the problem that these long leads right here that go between the base of the vacuum tube and up into the actual tube um, are severely limiting in that they're inductors, right? And so if you try and pass couple hundred mega, you know, more than a few hundred megahertz through that, it's an inductor and it filters it out. Um, so this is what's called a lighthouse triode. Um, this is good for about 200 watts pulsed output and is this big. Um, as you'll notice, the cathode grid plate interface is all right here. Um, what's also interesting about this is the fact that the plate, the grid, and the cathode are these three stacked layers on the glass envelope there. And so you actually have three concentric feed lines, or three concentric waveguides really, coming into the vacuum tube. And those three waveguides are impedance matched feed points into the transistor. Right? Combining the three concentric waveguides is a mess, and you usually have a box about this big that's completely silver plated above it. Um, but in the actual tube interface, it looks like that. Any questions on just the basic triad at this point? Um, we've got 10 minutes left at this point. Um, going over what the other grids would be for, uh, one limitation of the cathode grid plate triode is that it tends to have lots of distortion, right? By the fact that the current between the cathode and the plate is very much defined by the voltage between the cathode and the plate. But if you're running a standard amplifier configuration, that voltage is going to change when the output voltage changes. Right? If, you, if the output voltage goes, drops, the voltage across the plate and the cathode also drops, which means the current goes down, which means that the voltage goes back up. But that means that it's right. So I mean, it, it's, it tends to, you tend to see a lot, a lot more distortion and getting a linear amplifier out of triode is hard. So what you do is you put in the second grid called the screen grid, which you then set at a fixed rate, which is usually on the order of about half the plate voltage up to the full plate voltage, and it doesn't change. And so that way, when the electrons here are going to be accelerated away from the cathode and are going through the grid, the electrostatic potential they see is between the cathode and this fixed voltage. They inevitably miss and strike the plate, and so it's only in this region here that it goes, oh, wait, it's changing, right? But at that point, you've already gotten through the control grid and your linearity has been preserved, right? And so the screen grid um, compensates for this nonlinearity in it and also helps to protect capacitive feedback between controls and uh, control grid and plate, which um, in Transistors is the parasitic capacitance right here, which for transistors isn't a big deal because they're this big. But when you're talking about a plate that is this big, um, the capacitance between the two of those tends to limit your upper frequency response. Right. So having the screen there to just act as a capacitive shunt to some power rail um, isolates the uh, improves the upper frequency limit on 
the tubes as well. This is a tetrode. Uh, I believe this is about 300 watts output um, and a banana for scale. Um, and <laughs> you can see that this is the cooling fin. And so the way that you would operate this is both of these are sideways. Um, is this would stand vertical in the top of your case and then you have a shroud that comes over it and you would have a blower that forces air through um, the actual fins here, right? Because um, that makes it much, much more viable to dissipate several hundred watts in one of these things as opposed to a transistor where even like a, a TO3 power package, you really top out about 100, 120 watts and you need really good thermal grease at that point and you're running 200 degrees Celsius, right? Where these things are still hot to touch, but when you put a shroud over this, you have a lot of surface area to cool with. All right, then we can add, start adding more grids. Um, I, I could keep going for another two hours, because I mean, like, they, some of the tubes get up to eight grids. Um, but I'll just talk about the first three. So here's the control. It's what you use to modulate it typically. The screen is then used to protect the cathode gr grid interface there between the changing output. And then the suppressor grid is used to protect you from the mechanical electron emissions that I mentioned at the very beginning. Because you guys are totally paying attention back then, right? Um, once you pass the electrons from here through a grid that's sitting in the negative 10 to negative 40 range, and then it goes through the screen, it's been accelerated from negative 30 or 40 up to, you know, 150, let's say, for a 300 volt amplifier. It's then going to be accelerated another 150 volts. So it's going to strike that plate with something on the order of 250 to 350 volts velocity. This has a tendency to eject other <coughs> electrons, right? Um, for a, for a, you can surface treat either for or against these emissions. And so typically you see something on the order of about 0.3 to 0.5 secondary emissions per electron striking the plate. And those electrons don't necessarily come back to the plate, right? They fall onto the screen, they go this way, and that's not useful power going out the top of your tube by the current flowing in backwards of them, right? And so with just the, the tetrode, it's harder to get higher gains out of them. And so what you do is you tie the suppressor grid back to the cathode. You, you, put this, you, you put the suppressor grid at such a low potential that when a 300 volt electron hits the plate and ejects another electron at slightly less than 300 volts, it looks at a 300 volt negative potential here and goes, hell no, nah, and just falls back onto the plate and does you useful work. Right, so that's, that's the three plates right there. Controlling it, modulating it, uh, protecting you, isolating you between the control and, and the plate, and then finally suppressing any secondary electrons from the plate and so that they stay on the plate where they should so that they can flow out this way to make current go this way to make actual useful work up there. Right, so that is the pentode. Um, classic examples of the pentode is the 6146, which is on this scale. A lot of guitar amplifiers use this tube. This is one of, um, I don't think this one, I don't know of anyone who still produces these. Like this, this 813 was actually built relatively recently. I think it's about 1990s, 93. This was produced in 93. Because um, these are actually still used in inductive ovens. Um, the 6146 is a real decent <coughs> mid-range power tube. We're talking 50 watts. Um, and so it tends to be real popular with guitarists. Um, made by GE, back when GE asked, used to you know, make everything. Um, and so, there is a multitude of different examples, right? So there's the, the 813 is a pentode, um, which this one has a rate, has a plate dissipation of about 125, and so you get about 350, 375 watts out of it. Um, you tend to see a lot of high power stereo systems will use a pair of 813s in a push-pull configuration. And so you can combine the power of them. You'll, that's how you typically would build about 500 watt output speaker amplifier that you would feed with either a solid state or a smaller vacuum tube amplifier from your guitar so you can really wail some shreds or whatever it is. That's <laughs> awesome. One thing that's really interesting about this 813 is it doesn't have a metal plate. 
Most plates are some sort of you know plated steel or metal or iron. This right here is a graphite plate. Right? Even in a hard vacuum, which you have in here, and even with the where is it? It's not on there. Um, no, you can kind of see it. No, you can't. Um, no, there, even with the barium, is there's a barium, the silver spot that you see on each vacuum tube, that's a barium getter that is much, much more reactive than anything else in the vacuum. And so that if there's any trace amount of oxygen in there, it gets oxidized with that. Which means an easy way to do a quick check on if the tube's good or not. If it's silver and shiny, it's good. If it's black, it's questionable. And if it's bright white, you're hosed. Um, it's leaking. Um, but even with that getter and everything in here, having graphite in, in here gives you the advantage of being able to run it hotter and it being less reactive, right? Because it's hard, much, much harder to melt graphite. Like, I, I don't even think there's a meaningful melting point of graphite. I was trying to figure that out once and I couldn't come up with a number. Um, but yeah, so these are a small, small fraction of the tubes I have. I have about two large boxes of them that I've collected over the last few years. Um, the first tube I bought was actually this one right here. Uh, it was marked weak and it was 25 cents at a flea market. Um, and it came in the little RCA box, which I was amused by. Um, and it tested fine. I tested it later. Um, I bought that in about 2009, 2010. Um, and it's only been about the last year or so that I've really gotten interested in it and have been collecting textbooks on it and just reading it in my free time. Because that's what you guys do in your free time, right? Read more textbooks. Because right? yeah. that's, that's fun. Um, but so that's that's kind of, I've got about, something that we're about 100 to 150 tubes. Because it's a sickness. Yeah. What's your favorite source of high quality vacuum tubes? The favorite source? Dead amateur radio operators. <laughs> right? It's sad, but it's true. Um, you can get them at like electronics flea markets and, and ham fests but they will tend to be of dubious quality and um, outrageously expensive if they're anything except for a receiver tube. You can get receiver tubes for on the order of about a dollar a piece, and you can get power tubes for on the order of $200 a piece. Yeah, I mean, and you don't get to test audio them. Right. Um, but no, it's if, you, if you get involved in the amateur radio uh, community, um, we tend to die a lot, because we're all like 70 or 80, um, <laughs> except for me. Um, and so uh, they, when they pass away, a lot of the estates, the, the kids have no idea what to do with a cabinet full of like five or six hundred tubes. Um, I've helped a few estates deal with that many tubes before, and it's a good source of them. Have you used them in any circuits you've made? I actually have not, for the sole reason that I live by myself. Um, is I, when I do have friends over, I'm willing to deal with anything above 20 volts. But when I'm living in an apartment by myself, it's just not prudent, and I just yeah. am not willing to deal with it. Yeah. So if I ever end up in an apartment with multiple people, I will very. I, I have I have like three different amplifiers like drawn up and planned. I just am not willing to work on them. Someone over here? No. Nope. I was stretching. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Cool. So thanks for. Your If you want to come up and really look at detail on any of these, like this is a three kilowatt tube right here. Uh, they'll be here, and then we're going to migrate to the wireline. Thank you.